All right, well, my clock shows 1130. So welcome everyone to the Public Safety Coordinating Council meeting for November of 2021. My name is Eric Geyer, I'm the Director of Jackson County Community Justice, and I chair this meeting. Uh, we have a uh, full agenda today and a lot of interesting topics and some guest speakers that uh, I'm very excited about. We do have one um, alter uh, piece of our um, agenda, and that is that Siobhan Haynes, the watermaster, is not able to attend. And on our agenda, we have uh, Danny Jordan speaking to the impact of cannabis, but I believe Sheriff Sickler will speak to that piece today. Danny will be available for questions should the need come, come up, though. So uh, the first order of business uh, is uh, a new member, and it's uh, somebody who I've uh, really relied on as a colleague, uh, somebody that I've relied on to inform me about uh, how we work with people who are either justice involved or otherwise um, working through substance use disorder issues. And that is Nathan Olson. So Nathan, I gave you a little bit of a heads up that I would like you to introduce yourself and uh, kind of talk about why you're excited about being part of the LIPSIC, but to our newest confirmed member, Nathan. I'm the clinical director of uh, Addictions Recovery Center. I've been at the agency for about seven and a half years. I have a background in uh, social work. I have a graduate degree in social work and I I think that uh, bringing the social work perspective and the recovery community's perspective to LIPSIC will be beneficial. Um, I've had the pleasure of presenting to this committee before and also working with a lot of people that are involved with this committee. And so I'm really looking forward to um, engaging with this group and uh, bring, a, bring my perspective to it. Great. Well, Great. well thank you for joining us and uh, we're excited to have your perspective. So Excellent. thank you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. All right, uh, first order of business is uh, regarding Jackson County's strategic plan. And there is a vote required for this, but the, the deputy county administrator, Harvey Bragg, uh, is going to introduce this. And Harvey, rather than me kind of butchering what you're doing today, I kind of just want to hand the floor over to you and let you set it up from the get-go. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you giving me a couple of minutes here on your agenda. Um, so let me just start it off with this. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA, established the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award program back in 1984 to encourage and assist state and local governments to prepare budget documents of the uh, very highest quality that reflect both the guidelines established by the National Advisory Council on State and Local Budgeting and GFOA's best practices best practices on budgeting and then to recognize individual governments that succeed in achieving those goals. To earn the recognition, budget, budget documents must meet uh, program criteria and Excel as a policy document, financial plan, operation guide, and communication tool. Um, and they've changed these criteria from year to year. And Jackson County has won this presentation or this uh, award every year since the beginning, since 1984. And we want to continue to receive this. Anyway, um, the latest uh, revision to the plan or to the requirement is that we have a, a separate strategic plan. And that's now a mandatory criteria. Although Jackson County has been doing strategic planning for a long time, we haven't reported it separately. So what we've done here is lifted most of the information uh, required for a strategic plan out of our budget document. And now we're presenting it separately. Um, I'll just say that the things that we have here, our, our goals, our values, so on and so forth, um, like I said, are in there for a long time. Uh, all of the measures that we have aren't necessarily the only measures that we're going to continue to include or that we're going to watch. Um, things that we do report in our strategic plan, we do want those to be things that the county can control. I mean, we all want world peace, but that's not something that the county can take care of. Um, so when we're looking at this strategic plan, we're really looking for things that the county has some kind of control over and that we can measure, measure uh, progress towards obtaining those goals. Having said that, uh, did send this out earlier, so I hope that you've had a chance to uh, look it over. Did get feedback from Jennifer, I think her last name, Malinick. Um, she did propose that we have a, add a value that said, uh, basically to, uh, let's see, a commitment to equity for all residents and visitors of Jackson County. So. Appreciate that feedback, and frankly, we'll probably add that as one of our values. 
Uh, but if there is anything else that you wanted to add, I'm here to, to talk with you about that. Um, sure, Glenda. This is Hilda Montenegro. Oh, Hilda, I'm sorry. And I had the exact same thought. I read through your documents that you sent and I was um, surprised and uh, honestly a little bit disappointed that I didn't hear anything about equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in you know where I feel the world is today. It, it feels very important to um, acknowledge and, and make some kind of statement where these get added to the values that we hold most important. And it has to do with recognizing who even lives here in Jackson County and making sure that we are staying, we see everyone that lives here and we, we are behind all of our communities. And so I'm really glad to hear that somebody had also noticed that and, and flagged this. So all I would say is recommend diversity and inclusion to the word equity um, when it comes to our values. And um, I also, because you just said about what the county can actually take care of and that we can have very lofty ideals and what, what are ways of measuring progress and that can become uh, tricky, right, to, to demonstrate. But I do believe that already we have been making progress and it would be nice to even recognize that. Um, yeah, so. As I mentioned, we'll add that as one of our values. Um, it's not something we me necessarily measure uh, directly, but um, when we go about our business, we certainly want to recognize that's one of our values. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah, and I think it also um, puts us in a position to be accountable, to be held accountable, that we are focusing on that and doing something about it. So I am very glad that that will be adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. We'll turn it back over to Eric. Harvey, hold on. This is Danny. I just want to add, if sure. anyone... If something comes to anyone's mind, still please provide it back to us as input. This is going to be an open process. We're going to go to all of the advisory committees of the county and also open this up for public input at some point. So the process is not just today as your one chance to contemplate what might be good to add into this. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, we outlined it in the documentation. I think that we sent out uh, the next steps after we get done with our advisory committees is um, we'll basically provide that input to the Board of Commissioners again, then we'll have a public hearing. Uh, then we'll put this uh, uh, plan on our website and allow the public to provide input for about a month. And then at the conclusion of that, we'll have another public hearing and uh, hopefully the board will be able to adopt the strategic plan. So uh, yes, we certainly have time after this, but wanted to give uh, certainly all of our advisory committees an opportunity for input before we uh, put this out to the general public. Harvey, did you need a vote on anything today uh, to bring back with you? Um, if you want, if you'd like to vo vote to support what we've got so far, or that'd be great. So we have a proposed uh, addition. Uh, I technically that came from this group and I don't want to break protocol, um, but Jennifer and Hilda have both uh, proposed language to be included regarding equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, are there any other comments uh, or recommendations before we could put forth a vote of potential support? Hearing no other additions other than the inclusion of those terms, is there a, a motion to uh, support the uh, revised county goals and strategic plan as, uh, as with the proposed amendment. Currently, we have a motion from Sheriff Sickler that we, uh, or that we vote in support of the county's uh, revised uh, strategic plan and goals with the um, added, added language regarding equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, do we have a second for that motion? Judge Mejia, I'll second that. Judge Mejia with a second, great. And Jasmine, will you please do a roll call vote of our members? Okay, starting with Joshua Aldrich. Yes. Travis Christian. Yes. Chief Clausen. Yeah. Commissioner Dodder. Uh, since I will be eventually voting on this, I will abstain. Okay. Doug Engel. Yes. Eric Geyer. Yes. Barbara Johnson. Yes. Danny Jordan. Yes. Judge Mejia. Yes. 
Hilda Montenegro Fix. Yes. Tina Qualls. Yes. Sheriff Sickler. Yes. Rita Sullivan. Yes. Nathan Olson. Yes. And then we have a Jennifer in the group right now. Is that Jennifer Lind or Jennifer Mylinick? It's Jennifer Lind and I vote yes, thanks. Okay, that's everyone. All right, thank you, Jasmine. And Harvey, thank you for bringing that up. Eager to see how that, that ends up. Thank you. Our next item of business uh, is regarding the minutes from the October meeting. Uh, everybody's had a chance to read those. Um, is there any discussion or uh, comments regarding the notes or the minutes? This is Danny Jordan, I'll move to approve. Danny Jordan has moved to approve. Do we have a second? This is Jennifer Lind, I'll second. Jennifer Lind with a second. All right, one more roll call vote for the day. Uh, Jasmine, if you would, please, thank you. Okay, uh, Joshua Aldrich? Yes. Travis Christian? Yes. Travis Christian, did he say yes? Might have missed him. We'll come back. Chief Clausen? Yeah. Commissioner Daughter? Yes. Doug Engel? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Eric Geyer? Yes. Barbara Johnson? Yes. Danny Jordan? Yes. Jennifer Lind? Yes. Judge Mejia? I have to abstain on this one. Hilda Montenegro Fix? Yes. Tina Qualls? Yes. Sheriff Sickler? Yes. Rita Sullivan? Yes. And Nathan Olson? Yes. And Travis Christian? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks all for your attention to those minutes. And again, the, the detail in those minutes and um, the amount of information really appreciated. So thank you, Jasmine, very much. Those are, they look great. The impact of cannabis production in Jackson County is something that we've all been talking about for quite a while, particularly in this group. Um, we've seen some of the ways that it's impacted the criminal justice system, but what we haven't done is some of the in-depth talk around the other ways it impacts our community adversely and creates hardship for what we're trying to do in creating a, a better way of life for our residents. Uh, so we're putting together a, a kind of robust uh, group of folks to talk about the different ways that that impact hits our community. And while we don't have uh, Siobhan Haynes here today, uh, the, the county water master, we will invite him for a future date. And I'm sorry, Kathy Kissy, uh, we, mis we mislabeled you on the agenda, but we're so grateful that you're here from UNITE. So thank you for joining us and being willing to, to share kind of your experiences and, and some concerns around this issue to create better awareness for our residents. So first off, we have Sheriff Sickler and Sheriff, I'll uh, turn the floor over to you on uh, this presentation. So thank you. Thanks again, everybody for being here today. Uh, I know it's a short week with the, the holiday, so appreciate your attendance. Um, we've been talking a lot about marijuana, cannabis, hemp, all of the above um, for a lot of months now. It's uh, had a very significant impact on uh, my job duties as well as several others because we've had to kind of shift gears a little bit to address a problem that's been there for quite some time but really seemed to um, come to the forefront this year. We've had a, a significant amount of uh, grows pop up and uh, a lot of issues associated with that. So we get started. Historically, I just like to go through this and say, how did we get here? Like, how did we get to be the epicenter for marijuana cultivation, cannabis cultivation in the state of Oregon? Um, so it goes back, 1998, um, voters passed Measure 67, which essentially allowed uh, medical marijuana program kind of foot in the door, so to speak. And then since then, there's been multiple attempts to get to where we pretty much are here now, which is, you know, recreational marijuana, decriminalized drugs, all sorts of things. But uh, just to go through this, the voters turned this down several times. Uh, 2010, the voters turned down a ballot measure to allow the re retail sales of marijuana. In 2012, voters rejected it yet again. 
Um, but they did approve for a medical marijuana dispensary registry system. We did see some problems with that. I remember when I was in detectives, we would have to go out and we, we uh, did some search warrants at a couple different locations in the county for people who were taking advantage of the, uh, uh, of the system that was set up. And then 2014, this is when it really, you know, really changed for us. Measure 91 passed by voters to legalize marijuana for recreational use. And then in 2015, the law took effect and those 21 years and older could possess up to one ounce in public and have eight ounces in their home. Um, then in 2016, retail sales and production licenses were approved. And that's when we really started to see kind of the influx of grows all over the county. And when I say all over, it was literally all over. Um, we have, uh, I think Danny Jordan did a flyover in the county in 16 or 17, and you could just kind of see marijuana fields uh, all over the place from the air. And, you know, I think when the, the law was passed, there was this very misguided thought that, you know, people will get into the OLCC registry system or be in the uh, uh, OMMP program, which is the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. And that anyone that doesn't, the police will just go out, the sheriff's office, the state police or the local police and deal with it. Uh, but literally, and I say this, seemed like thousands of grows popped up in, in one year, making it impossible uh, for law enforcement to deal with um, at, at, a, at what I'm sure was intended by uh, the rules committee, whoever passed the rules and, and subsequently uh, the voters, right? Saying, hey, you know, if it's illegal, the police will deal with it. If not, everyone will be fine. And, and so what we, what we saw was uh, a ton of unregistered grows. Uh, people were planning while licenses were uh, in process because OLCC didn't have near the resources needed to regulate this industry. OMMP didn't have the resources to regulate it. Um, and then it became really convoluted for law enforcement. You know, uh, how do you invest, you know, the two systems weren't sharing information readily. And it was just, it, it was real cumbersome for investigations to take place, certainly beyond the scope of what, you know, patrol deputies, you know, or city police officers may have the time to do in their day-to-day -day calls. I remember we had, um, you know, we had a guy who um, uh, was involved in a parachuting accident out in Sam's Valley, you know, parachute didn't open. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he, he uh, died as a result of the accident. And of course, you know, all the deputies and, you know, the Emmys and medical personnel, and everybody went out to investigate this. And, you know, I remember getting a call the following day and someone says, well, that happened right next door to an Ill illegal grow and you guys didn't do anything about it. It was like every call we go to, it seems like we're next door to an illegal grow. We just can't, we don't have the resources to do it. Um, and then we, 2018, the farm bill authorizing hemp to be grown for export uh, changed things yet again. We saw a huge influx of hemp farms go up um, or people planting marijuana and hemp all over the county. I wanna say, I can't remember the exact acreage, uh, but it went, I think it was about 8,500 acres uh, from a very minimal amount prior to that. And then of course, 2020, the decriminalization of drugs, of, of hard drugs, such methamphetamine, um, heroin, pills, cocaine, uh, it became a violation instead of uh, a crime. And I think that's added to our challenge as we move through this, I'll kind of explain that, but all of this together has created really kind of a perfect storm uh, for, for enforcement difficulties. So to give you an idea of just how many sites we have locally and issues for compliance. So prior to this year, before Operation Table Rock happened, um, I don't know how many OLCC um, inspectors they had on the ground here, but I don't think it was more than 10. I think it was less. And then, you know, talking about the OMMP program, and then of course, ODA. ODA only had one inspector on the ground for, you know, Josephine and Jackson County. And you look at these licenses, you know, just these alone. So we have for recreational, so the OLCC, uh, 318 producers, um, 49 retailers and 38 processors. OMMP, you got over 1300 growers registered, over a thousand grow sites. And then hemp, you know, you have 247 active licensed growers and then you had 219 pending. And some of those obviously were growing. Um, and then you had 21 cancellations. Um, and I only highlight that because um, I've had to 
to do a public records request, but I do believe uh, many of those cancellations came after the OLC received um, authority to conduct inspections for the ODA. So once they found out that there was gonna be inspections, they had their licenses um, terminated or revoked. And uh, there, were some, there were some loopholes with the OLCC program, meaning if they weren't registered under the OLCC program, OLCC had no authority over them. So once they were unlicensed or pulled a license or their license revoked, it automatically became a law enforcement issue. So the systems weren't designed to work well together. Okay, uh, legislative impacts. Like I said, uh, Measure 110, 2020 voters decriminalized small amounts. Uh, but what that also did is it uh, funneled some tax re revenue from marijuana tax to, to build treatment resources in the state. Um, and uh, Dan, you can correct me if I have my numbers off a little bit, but it, I think it cut about $2 million annually from the county revenue, uh, which that money was used to fund or to be funding you know, the impacts caused by cultivation of cannabis. Um, in addition to increase, uh, the Measure 110 increased opportunities for drug trafficking. Uh, again, we've seen a large spike in fentanyl, especially with overdoses in Southern Oregon. And you know, just the general theme of, of to restrict law enforcement and some of their enforcement efforts, I think has really been a detriment to, to our community. Um, and just when you just look at the overdoses alone, you know, I think I'll, I'll uh, kind of take an analogy from one of our co um, partners in the criminal justice system is we used to have a lot of stop signs and you know law enforcement were able to provide kind of breaks or stops for some of these individuals getting them into custody and now we don't have that so it's kind of like a an auto bond and uh, the results aren't very good uh, impact to law enforcement services so you can see here by the graph um, the calls for service this is the graph portion of this and you can see in 2016 and 17 we started to spike uh, quite a bit and then in 2018 and 19 we were up to you know about almost 30,000 calls more than we had previous years and of course not all this is I'm going to say is related to marijuana but it's certainly a contributor to our calls for service and when you have a significant um, increase in calls for service, it reduces time for other things, proactive patrols, whether it's just, you know, patrolling through neighborhoods or county roads, looking for suspicious activity or just being a presence to deter things. The, the deputies are increasingly more busy and it takes time away from those um, proactive patrols, which um, can really have an impact on uh, both livability, because, uh, you know, people, most people like to see in our county still, sheriff's office deputies patrolling or police officers patrolling their cities. Uh, but when the calls for services increase because of various things, those times are reduced and it kind of has a, 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 you know, kind of the snowball effect. The less patrols, the less proactive work, the more opportunity for those that want to victimize the community have. And so the calls for service increase yet again. So it is, it is, a, it is a, a significant impact. Um, an increase in livability calls, and we'll talk about those as we move forward, but it's just not crime, but other things that necessarily um, might fall into the purview of a, another county department or stuff that, you know, is not necessarily doesn't really have a home per se, like, you know, just smells, stuff like that from the marijuana and noises from the fans and things of that nature. Um, detectives, our detective division has been um, impacted pretty negatively since we've Rec uh, had recreational marijuana. Um, at one point, I think it's eight states now, but we had uh, confirmed complex uh, robbery home invasion cases. We had crews from eight different states, seven different states come in here to do these elaborate home invasion robberies. And we have a significant nexus uh, from marijuana to homicide cases. Um, we have had about 20 different homicide cases for the sheriff's office in the last three years, about 75% of those have an excess to, to marijuana somehow, whether it's under the influence or there's a grow there or there's a processing lab or they're just users. Um, so a pretty significant um, impact to our resources as a sheriff's office. When we talk about some of the impacts to the community, um, you know, we have property line disputes, easement disputes. We have people making um, significant adjustments to their property, uh, altering it, maybe without the proper 
permitting or planning, and I'll let code enforcement talk about that, but they call us when they have disputes over these things, so our deputies have to go out to these calls and, and try to mediate these issues um, or end up taking criminal reports because somebody lost their temper and, and um, you know, did something illegal. Uh, traffic complaints, that's been a, a big thing. I hear that quite a bit, whether it's just the amount of traffic or it's the, the nature of the traffic, people speeding. Um, we've turned these rural areas that were fairly quiet, um, maybe had some farm activity on their properties to these more industrial-like type of operations where they have a lot of employees coming out on these gravel roads and kicking up dust. Um, we've had a significant increase this year in water trucks, uh, picking up water at our filling stations and driving them to all manners and all places in the county uh, because we've also been, you know, we've also had a shortage of water this year. You know, we're kind of, we're in a drought. And so when you increase the demand by all these grows that have gone up and then you, you know, decrease the resource, people are scrambling and a lot of it's being hauled in in trucks and it, it has impacts to our county roads. They got to try to maintain these roads that were not designed to handle this type of commercial traffic in these big trucks. Uh, so that's, that's uh, causing them work. Uh, impacts to our small or rural small bridges where they've been damaged. Um, fatal crashes uh, and our star callouts are way up this year. I don't have the exact number, but I think we've already exceeded this year than all of what we had last year. Uh, a lot of those are under the influence. Now that can be, you know, that's also marijuana and that's also, or um, sorry, alcohol and other drugs. But, you know, certainly 110 is contributing to that as well, in my opinion. And then of course we talked about the general livability issues. Smells, you know, I've been dealing, a lot of people have, uh, they get headaches um, and they want us to do something about the grows um, because they're impacted negatively by the look. Uh, we've had complaints of trailers and other criminal activity associated with grows that leaks out into the community. Talk about noise complaints, whether that be fans or that's gunfire, barking dogs, um, people just being loud uh, and fire hazards. Fire hazards, we've had um, some rural fires from BHO labs, which is butane honey oil explosions. We had one right across the street from our office and we just had one the other day. And these are dangerous. Um, you know, they've taken at least one life that I'm aware of at this point, which we have an active investigation into. Um, and then of course, there's the, the danger of just fire spreading. Um, and we're all very sensitive to that for, for obvious reasons. Um, but many of these labs are not um, constructed or inspected and taken care of as something that has these chemicals should be. Uh, and again, they're circumventing the system and causing significant issues. So in 2021, we saw this massive growth, uh, growth in uh, illegal growth compared to years prior. Um, so all, all the things that went on with this were, we, so we have a lot of different issues that are very difficult to kind of put your finger on. But so we have marijuana grown with no licensing, licensing at all, call those black market grows. They're just um, nothing. And then we have marijuana grown under hemp licensing. And that provides its own unique challenge because prior to the passage of 3000, which we'll get to, um, it was not a crime to grow hemp without a license. So growing a hemp plant without a license through the Oregon Department of Agriculture is merely just a violation or administrative rule violation. They had no law enforcement involvement. And you couldn't grow marijuana without a license or it was a crime. So those who were you know, acting nefarious and, and trying to circumvent the systems know that you can't tell the difference between a hemp plant and a marijuana plant at a distance. You know, you have to do a test. You have to use a, a test to confirm whether a plant is, you know, hemp or marijuana. And so it became a much different system for law enforcement to try to investigate some of these grows. So before uh, hemp, before, before people started growing a lot of marijuana under the guise of hemp, um, we would look at the, the licensing entities. So whether that's the ODA, I'm sorry, uh, OLCC, or OMMP, and if they didn't have a license before hemp, you could really assume that that was, you know, marijuana. Write a search warrant, and then go do your investigation. Uh, but with hemp, we couldn't do that any longer because we couldn't say for certainty that it wasn't hemp they were growing. So made it much more challenging for law enforcement. Slowed us down. Created a lot of, uh, you know, more tedious investigations instead of being able to do it quite quickly. Uh, and then you have the mix of. So you have the marijuana and hemp grown together. 
which is a is a real thing. We have it. They mix it in fields. They plant um, uh, portions of their grow as marijuana and hemp, or they have greenhouses on the same property as they have hemp, and just all manner of things. And then they can use the hemp to uh, help them disguise the marijuana for transportation or distribution. Um, grows exceeding site plans. So people will file with the OLCC to go out and do a site plan or a ODA, and then they grow grows bigger than what they're allowed to do by their site plan. Again, creates these problems within the licensing system on whose issue that should be. Uh, of course, then we have the OLCC um, license growers uh, where they're circumventing the metric system, meaning they're not reporting accurate weights or reporting crop loss or mold. And then they're shipping the, the marijuana all over, creating another avenue for distribution. Um, and then this year we saw the cartel. Um, quite a bit of our large scale grows uh, are associated with cartel. And of course that brings in a whole nother host of issues. And then we'll talk about labor trafficking, human trafficking, uh, additional human humanitarian issues. And Kathy Kesey is here today with UNITE to talk about some of those. So, you know, how do we, how do we investigate this and how do we address this huge problem? Um, you know, so finding the difference or the balance between neighborhood complaints and long-term DTOs. So that's a drug trafficking organization, um, you know, or large scale, the, the DTOs are large scale and far reaching, meaning they're uh, cross state lines frequently. They have uh, pretty elaborate uh, money laundering operations and you know very complex investigations that can take you know a year two years to um to to fully complete or do we just have a grow that the neighbors have been complaining about we know it's illegal it's not licensed and we need to go take care of that because it creates this perception that the law enforcement isn't doing anything about these illegal grows and we'll talk about that a little bit as well um so finding the balance between those with limited resources is a challenge uh, not to mention, we have to do partial interdiction. Um, we have a lot of marijuana and money being shipped through uh, our parcel services, whether that's a post service, FedEx, UPS, uh, you name it, they'll try it. And that can include other things like distillates or butane honey oil. Um, so yeah, it, it's very complex, a lot of work to be done. Uh, reverse buy operations became something we had to do for a while, which means you know you needed to get to, to prove that marijuana is being sold and not hemp. We've had lab explosions. We talked about that. Um, commercial airline passenger uh, interdiction. We've had people come in from various parts of the United States with lots of money uh, to buy marijuana. And so, you know, it just becomes a pretty complex issue. Um, and it's not just real simple. And this is some of the things that we've been trying to talk to our, our um, you know, legislators about and uh, the state about helping fund some enforcement efforts. Uh, this year, we, we had to um, adjust tactics and our IMET team did some knock and talk abatements, meaning there were so many grows to get at um, that we couldn't do these long term investigations, especially before House Bill 3000 passed. And so they would actually go with our partners in the county code enforcement, the ODA, OLCC, and, you know, do uh, knock and talks, which means consent visits of the site, find out that it was marijuana, and then they'd work on abatement of that grow. Um, but yeah, just, just a lot of different avenues. Just to give you an idea, this year, the uh, IMET team has been very busy. Although of course, when uh, our state police partner sees 500,000 pounds or whatever it was in one, one city, and that's, uh, that's pretty good. But these guys have been working really hard all year uh, in the last two years, and they've seized a, uh, about processed marijuana, about 100,000 pounds, nearly, you know, 660,000 plants have been seized or abated, 276 guns, uh, 25 pounds of methamphetamine, um, five pounds of heroin, and about $4.5 uh, million dollars have been seized and over 100 arrests. And that's just October to this year. And we anticipate, you know, the investigations will continue through the year, especially when we know that this is the time of year where, you know, we have a lot of the, the, the plants are drying and we're gonna start seeing a lot of the uh, distribution and then hopefully not, but this is kind of consistent with our, our home invasion issues because the money and the drugs are together. So it's just 
could be a challenging time for the rest of the year as well. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted Zook, who is uh, our Code Enforcement Department Director, Development Services, sorry, Ted, um, but uh, I'll let him take it from here. Thanks, Sheriff Zickler. Uh, kind of hard to follow some of the statistics that you, uh, you just had up there, but in addition to the Code Enforcement, we have the Building Division and the uh, Planning and Land Use Division. So a lot of what we do are livability issues. Uh, the Code Enforcement's primarily uh, to take care of the building and planning issues that we run into. So what we're running into is uh, the unpermitted construction, uh, the people in the RVs and tents that aren't supposed to be out there uh, camping, the extraction systems, those are the carbon-based ones. And we all know they go boom. Uh, we've seen enough of that. They should be inspected. The uh, illegal uh, electrical uh, in the farmlands we're seeing. If you could back up, Nate, on that first picture there. This, I like this picture here. This, this shows a lot of what we're going to talk about. You know, uh, part, part of it to have the, the cannabis operation, whether it's hemp or uh, marijuana, uh, needs to be EFU or uh, forest resource land. Uh, and as you can see, what they're doing is they're destroying our farmland. Uh, those driveways, uh, that ain't coming back as farmland. That's uh, not being protected resource. The, you know, the, the buildings out there, uh, they either need to have an agricultural exemption from a permit or they need to have a permit and these uh, buildings never do. Uh, they've got the plastic issue. You can see it out in the fields out there. That's environmental issues. Uh, the RVs on the property. I mean, it, it, this encapsulates a lot of what we're seeing, those livability issues. So yeah, the violations that we see are, are those uh, like the greenhouses uh, out there. Obviously they don't meet building code. Uh, there, there's an issue with that. The, with the water use, you can see the lines on the ground that uh, illegally uh, diverting the water uh, or bringing uh, potable water in on trucks uh, to be uh, used on their grows. In a land use issue, like I said, it's, a res it's all resource lands that this is the only place that hemp or marijuana would be the allowed. So, so here's some pictures of the electrical. Uh, it's both the electrical and mechanical, those fans that blow all night that drive the neighbors uh, uh, crazy, the, uh, the complicated uh, uh, humidity and uh, light deprivation systems that they have. But this is typical of what we see out there for electrical. This stuff is not inspected. They're in wet locations, uh, damp locations with all that humidity. Uh, workers are around the uh, the sites, it, it is dangerous. Uh, one of the things I, I will say about the land use side of things was that back in 2016, we were given the ability to do time, manner, and place on marijuana. And we have a section on our land development ordinance that talks about what you can and can't do when you're growing marijuana out there. Once hemp came uh, into the picture, that section became pretty much uh, Black, better words, useless. Everybody's growing hemp now. Nobody's growing marijuana uh, until they get tested, uh, until uh, Sheriff Sickler pays them a visit. At that point, we can go in and use our marijuana uh, ordinance because now we know it actually is marijuana because it's been, been tested. Uh, and where we get to cooperate uh, and, and our part or a little bit in this is because what we have are civil penalties. They're not criminal penalties. So these land use violations, these building violations, there, there could be a fine associated with that that can go back to the, uh, to the owner of the property. We're trying to do a lot of education along that line to uh, let the property owners know that just because somebody comes out and gives you $100,000 cash and says, I wanna rent your, uh, lease your property and I'm gonna do everything legal and oh, by the way, I'm just a hemp grower. It's probably good for you to be suspicious about that because the fines can come back uh, as pretty hefty, and we'll go over that on our slide coming up. So you keep moving if you'd like, Sheriff. These I put in here, uh, I know we're going to be talking about the human trafficking and the conditions that they live in, but th these are just some of the pictures that are typical. Code enforcement goes out and sees this in just about every site, you know, as, as does the Sheriff. But I mean, just... Uh, you take a look at that top picture there, there's people in tents and there's squalor conditions. They also take a look at the fact that they're in a greenhouse. There's plastic over that. 
in the summertime, that is over 100 degrees in there. It is not a good place to be, uh, to be living uh, or camping out in there. You know, secondly, uh, you know, obviously it doesn't meet building code. Look at the, the two by fours and stuff there. But if that were to catch fire, we now have all that bisqueen, which is basically going to turn into liquid plastic and drop down and trap people. Not, uh, you know, when we talk about things like the, the, the building code, and it's like, wow, that's uh, it's kind of a stretch maybe for, uh, you know, the marijuana problems. It's, it's a safety, it's a life safety issue for a lot of this. So we keep moving. Just more pictures. Uh, like I said, you see this on just about every site, uh, to one degree or another. Uh, next slide, okay, so this is where we're at. So in 2015, before marijuana was uh, legalized, legalized, we had 599 code enforcement case. That's everything. That was that was uh, solid waste. That was people uh, having businesses they shouldn't have. It was a lot of things. You know, uh, had a hearings office the other day. We had some solid waste cases, and he's, his comment was how much he missed those. Uh, we didn't have any marijuana. 2016, marijuana became legalized in March. We had our land development ordinance where we put the time, manner, and place rules. And in that first year, we jumped up to 902 cases, and 333 of them were marijuana related. So in that first year, 36% of our cases are now marijuana, and uh, we almost doubled the number of cases we had. 2021, and this is back to October, so these numbers are a little higher than this actually. 1,632 cases and 927 of cannabis related. So the 1,632 goes up because that's all those building code violations, that's the land use violations that go along with the cannabis, but not directly a cannabis uh, enforcement case. But you know that puts us at uh, almost 60%, 57% uh, of our cases now are, are cannabis related. And we used to only have three code enforcement officers and their caseload was 300 cases a piece. Uh, considering a number of days in a year, that was just impossible for us to, uh, to manage. Uh, we do have three code officers uh, that we just hired within uh, the last uh, several weeks. They're in training, obviously code officers just aren't gonna be going out to a marijuana case right off the bat and say, here you go. Uh, so it's going to take a lot of training. Uh, we're hoping to have them up and running uh, for, you know, next season, if you will, although there really is not a season. They go year long uh, in a lot of these grow sites. Uh, but we need at least three more. And that's part of the funding that we're asking for. We need more hearings officers, at least one more hearings officer. Uh, our cases right now are into May with the hearings officers that we have. Uh, cannabis cases. By then, they're going to be start growing the next season already, and we won't be done with the cases we have from this year. So that just gives you an idea of the enormity of, of what we're looking at. So next slide. Uh, yep. And so a lot of people think that this is, well, the growing season's over. The, everything is uh, taken care of. It's, it's done for this year. We can breathe until next. Uh, it's not the case. Like I said, the, the code enforcement case, uh, the hearings are into next year already. Uh, there's a lot of grow sites out there that are in uh, steel buildings that uh, they're, still, they're still running. They're going full production uh, year round. But the ones that did grow outdoors, uh, this is what we get left. You know, this is after the, the greenhouses are gone. This is, uh, we've got the solid waste issue now. We still have that unsafe electrical out there that has never been safe off. We have the plastic, all the environmental concerns. Uh, the, the solid waste uh, can be things like the places where they had no you know, restroom facilities, bathroom facilities, and there it's just uh, human feces. More pictures of the same thing, uh, but basically the issue doesn't go away just because uh, the main season for marijuana has, has, has passed. Okay, so this is the civil part. This is what we do from a civil standpoint. Uh, 
Initial fines can be a thousand dollars up to a thousand dollars per count. So a typical case that we would go out there, one of those greenhouses that didn't have the building permit or the agriculture exemption from a permit, that would be a thousand dollars there. They usually all have the electrical, there's another thousand dollars, and then they have the, the land use issues because once we can now prove that they are marijuana, uh, they 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 require the land use to uh, to get the permit for that. Uh, like I said, we're doing a lot of education with the uh, the owners on what these fines could possibly be because the second time a continuing violation violation goes up to ten thousand dollars per count. You know, so now we're talking thirty thousand dollars per structure. You can usually get these fines up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If we were able to get to the third fine uh, set of fines, it would be up to twenty thousand dollars. But usually in a grow season, we never get that far. So, but you, they can get up to thirty thousand dollars a structure. Uh, we're trying to let the homeowners know, uh, or not the homeowners, the property owners know that you know, watch those leases. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, teeth to go any further than that because. They are heavily layered uh, and intentionally structured uh, leases, leases that we don't actually know who money's actually coming from. That is where our partners in law enforcement uh, are doing their investigations into that end of it. But from our uh, end of it, we don't have a lot that we can go on there. And the only thing left is, is uh, basically the uh, property owners to let them know it's not a good idea no matter how how much they tell you that it's legal if it's too good to be true that they're handing you a pile of cash it's too good to be true and uh, there's consequences to it as i did mention we have seen a substantial impact in complaints uh since uh this year but even prior the work for the water master went up considerably in 2016 and 17 with uh, recreational marijuana and then again in hemp with hemp. So just uh, kind of an illustration of kind of what we see at some of these grows that don't have uh, water plans or don't have water rights. They have to improvise and you see all these buckets of water and hoses and pumps and things to uh, water these operations. Um, and a lot of this water is most likely now, I can't speak specifically to this grow, but it, the way it's designed, looks like to me, is going to be water trucked in, or sometimes water is diverted from other sources. So if it's close to a creek, I know we have a lot of instances of people diverting water from the creek without water rights to do so, or the river. Um, people will pull their trucks in and fill up there. We've had instances of uh, actually damming up small areas and diverting water. So downstream of the grow, the creek goes dry, but people have dug holes or done whatever to, to take the water for their grows. And again, this is without the water rights in many cases. And these are all things that the water master would have to um, investigate upon, uh, you know, a complaint and then getting, you know, probable cause to go onto land or permission or whatever else they need. And, you know, I don't pretend to know all their processes, uh, but frequently these types of um, locations need to be gone to with law enforcement, you know, as partners because of some of the dangers associated with them. So the, the water master is, is under resourced as well. Um, and I know that was a, a big concern for them trying to get to all the complaints. Here's another thing you see some of the uh, environmental impacts, chemicals, water, just, just really a lot of disregard for uh, the environment with these grows. And this isn't uncommon. Um, you know, we, we, we see a lot of things and a lot of things that are even worse than this um, at these locations. Our IMET team has, has dealt with a whole bunch of issues, um, you know, from raw sewage, you know, human waste being uh, deposited all over the environment and near the waterways and all kinds of violations such as this. Hey, Danny, did you have anything you wanted to touch on with water before I move on? Um, I'll just add that similarly to code enforcement, the number of complaints in the water master's office, I think has gone up about 800%. And they have about, literally the county funds additional water master staff above the state Oregon Water Resource Department, but they're dedicated to stream gauge monitoring their contracts for irrigation districts. They really don't have the ability often to go out and look at these complaints. I think the water master's office is able to get to like, literally 
uh, to investigate these complaints, maybe 40 a year, and we're talking about seven or 800 complaints. The other thing is when OLCC and ODA did come out and inspect these sites, especially the hemp grows, um, they created GIS information from their site visits. And we are, we are able to pull that GIS ARC data and overlay it with water complaints. And almost every single site OLCC visited also has a concurring water, water complaint with it. So, you know, you're talking the state agencies needing to work together between uh, the, the criminal administrative enforcement and also the well, water enforcement. So just a couple of more kind of blatant, obvious issues, Sheriff, and that's all I have to add. All right, thanks, Danny. Um, so now these complaints are certainly more now than they've been in the past, but we've had these issues really since 2017, 16, 17. 17 is the first year I remember, probably because I was became the sheriff that year, and then I was, you know, really tasked of dealing with it at that level. But, you know, we tried to address this uh, initially, um, you know, with two deputies who were hired through the COPS grant, and that's the uh, a uh, federal grant to hire community-oriented policing uh, positions. And so, you know, we had a very unique problem, probably that one of the most unique problems in the United States with regards to recre uh, recreational marijuana, not that we were the first state, but I think we really put uh, fewer parameters around it than other states, which really led to this, you know, what we call the, uh, the green rush, people moving here from all over the country to grow marijuana. Uh, you know, we're located in the Emerald Triangle, which is a well known for, for the quality of marijuana that's produced. And so we have people from uh, pretty much every state at one time or another that have been here to either buy or, or cultivate marijuana. In fact, uh, I want to say Josephine County, the sheriff was telling me that they have confirmed, I want to say, owners of property in their county from 40 different states. It could be more, but I'm, I'm being conservative with that number. So people buying property for the cultivation of, of cannabis in their, in their county. And initially we focused on some compliance, some minor criminal offenses, you know, maybe some search warrants on a smaller level, mediation between landowners, um, address livability issues with, uh, um, in concert with code enforcement. So we, we started working closely with code enforcement back then to, to get to some of these areas. But again, we're talking at a small scale and just trying to kind of, you know, uh, kind of put a bandaid on it because we had so many complaints and we didn't have anybody to really deal with it. Madge, uh, did some work, of course. They were our local drug team, um, but you know they were working all manner of drug cases, not just marijuana. So they were able to assist them. Um, a lot of work, um, a lot of uh, I want to say, trying to enlighten our 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 state government on what was going on. The U.S. Attorney was pretty involved at that time. We had a couple of summits in which um, I would like to say, you know, I think part of that work helped contribute to uh, the uh, creation of our IMET team. And that was through Senate Bill 1544 in early 2018. So the state dedicated some funding uh, for resources, uh, four, in, four agencies ended up sharing that funding and we were awarded about 580,000 a year. We formed a partnership under the MAG umbrella with Medford Police Department, the DA's office, and um, you know, started hiring staff to address the marijuana issue. And they've done a great job. You know, they're, they're really working. And it's like beating back a forest fire with a, you know, super soaker. But they're really uh, doing a great job of, 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 of doing what they can do. Um, and then, of course, this year with the explosion, I think, you know, we're getting more attention around this issue. But the impact to the industry is what's, uh, I think, driven some of this conversation. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, you know, the industry is heavily regulated if they're doing everything legally and they're taxed and they, and they um, you know, have a lot of hoops to jump through in essence, whether that's the, the cultivation or they're doing um, edibles or processing or whatever it is. There's some, you know, regulated uh, steps they have to go through, licensing, inspections and all these things. And when they can look down the street and see four grows that are unlicensed and uh, processing lab and you know whatever else that is completely unlicensed and there's nothing that happens to them it, it makes it creates a 
real dilemma for you know people that are trying to do it right um, or creates a lack of trust in the in the government system because you know here they are paying their taxes and their dues and doing it right and they're seeing all these people get away with it so it becomes this this uh, almost like a broken weir- window theory so to speak if people if we don't address the the, the criminal issues uh, it can bring more criminal issues or uh, you know kind of manifest this why follow the rules attitude and so uh, luckily we have a great relationship with our our um, you know, the the legal growers of the industry, they're working um, with our um, marijuana advisory committee. Um, they work with, uh, you know, other government entities to help root out the, uh, the, the problem growers, but it's just a big task. So <clears throat> that's where we're at now. And uh, we'll talk about House Bill 3000 in a second, but I wanted to give Kathy an opportunity to present. Hey everybody, good afternoon. I'm Kathy Kazee and I'm the program coordinator with UNITE, Center for Farmworker Advocacy. For those of you who aren't familiar with UNITE, we've been serving farm workers and immigrant families in the Rogue Valley since 1996. So this year we're completing 25 years of um, serving the families. We provide educational and advocacy services for families. So um, the impact of the hemp has been pretty negative. I, Sheriff Sickler mentioned that it was uh, the perfect storm. So we call it kind of the the triple whammy, you might say. So the first of all, an average year for an agricultural worker here in the valley is they'll start with pruning or planting early in the spring, work hard all summer long to bring as much money as they can. A lot of these crops are peace, peace crops, so they will get paid by the pound or however, and some of them are hourly wages as well around here. And then, and then all this money is saved up so that over the winter, which is very, very lean, there's very few jobs available, they're able to support their, continue to support their families, pay their rent, take care of utilities, things like that. So what we saw last year, what we are call a triple whammy is, um, was first of all, the egg workers were hit with COVID. And so a lot of them were considered essential workers. So they were, con- they had to continue to be in the, um, at the workplace, even without um, proper PPE, they weren't being allowed to social distance. Um, there were also people that had their own small businesses. And so they couldn't do landscaping anymore. They were childcare providers, so they couldn't do childcare because people didn't want them in their homes or their housekeepers or whatever. So they're, the COVID really negatively impacted the Latino AX community. One thing that we did see um, with COVID, you can go ahead and go to the next slide if you want. So one thing we did see with COVID was the um, situations like this, where we saw huge outbreaks in the hemp fields, hemp and marijuana. So people who were either trimming the marijuana buds or whatever they were doing, they weren't again allowed to social distance. But at one point in Jackson County, and this is all before the vaccines, there was um, the Latino population made up 56% of all the positive cases. So they were incredibly negatively impacted. And there were several deaths in these families as well from from COVID. And as you can see, like they mentioned before, the illegal electrical, there's no ventilation in there. There's no way for them to even begin to social distance. They were threatened by the bosses that if they did say they had a sore throat or had a cough or something that they were going to be fired. And we all know that this was a time where, again, there were no, there weren't jobs available. There just simply weren't jobs available. So the ones that they, um, out of necessity, they moved into the, into the hemp. I mean, some were there before. It used to be a pretty lucrative um, occupation because they were paying forty dollars, fifty, even a hundred when they really needed people to be trimming. They were even a hundred dollars a pound or something. But now it's not. We don't. We're not seeing those kinds of of wages any longer. Um, so what I really think that this whole hemp marijuana stuff it's it's developed. Um, it's produced like a very very vulnerable population. So as you can see here again, that maybe this is possible sleeping quarters. Or you've seen the pictures that um, the Ted was showing of them living outside in tents. So some of the things that um, we try to do outreach to the hemp farms and it's impossible. They have armed guards at the gates. So you can't, there's no way you could even try to get in. Um, the workers also have mentioned that those threat, they threaten them if they decide that they want to go after their unpaid wages, um, that they're threatened, you know, guns to their head. We're going to harm your families in Mexico or wherever the people come from. So we saw a lot of that with the COVID. Oops, sorry. And so, um, the next thing that hit these workers were the fires. And so then a lot of the workers who um, had affordable housing, were in the trailers and things that were destroyed, now that housing was gone too. 
So also several of them have like their life savings. Literally, we had one guy that lost $12,000 cash that he had hidden in, hidden in his trailer because they didn't trust the banking system. And so all of their savings essentially was gone. So that just love, adds another level of vulnerability for these workers. And now when we see that um, rent is outrageous here in the Valley, there's people who are doubling up, tripling up families and people are living in, again, Ted <laughs> said you more work in, um, the, in garages, in other places where they simply aren't, it's not, they're not compliant at all up to code. A lot of people are, like I mentioned, two, three families living together because they just simply can't afford the rent. And so another um, issue, again, we come back to the drought. And so the drought hit the valley again this year and again, really negatively impacted agricultural workers. I don't know how to emphasize that enough. A lot of the growers, um, well, especially in the grapes, which is a pretty, was a good place for people to work. It was a the conditions there weren't perfect, but they were much better than we, anything compared to the hemp. Um, they had access to water, OSHA, when things were able to go out and do investigations, when there were issues that we could, we would call in where, you know, people not having access to bathrooms or not having access to cool water, shade, things like that. So what we saw was um, with the drought, again, the growers who, the people who would normally work in the grapes, the growers decided basically just keep their plants alive because they knew there was going to be a shortage of water. And in some as early as even April of last of this year, the water was cut off to some of the grape growers. And so, um, again, that reduced, you know, crews of 40 workers down to three, the people that were there just to tie the plants up or, you know, do some thinning, things like that. And so um, what we saw was just at a, even in the pears, this year pears, you're in the pears, because traditionally that was what agriculture was here was pear and peach harvest. Um, there was also some strawberries, there are large corn grows, hay, um, livestock, taking care of livestock. Well, when the hemp business started, all of those other types of agriculture essentially disappeared other than the grapes. And so we still have the pears. However, this year, again, with the drought, um, Bear Creek orchards, instead of what they usually pick 15, 10 to 15,000 tons of fruit a year, this year they picked five. And so they were, again, had to decide on what areas they were gonna let go. They only brought in 200 workers this year on top of the um, local workers that they employ. And so it was a huge hit again. And so these families are, t they're in such vulnerable situations that it's really their only, their only choice. There's no, other, there's no other jobs essentially for them. And so one issue that we really see is that um, we've had about 200 wage complaints come into our office. And a lot of them we refer up to Bureau of Labor, up to Boley, but again, it's all about enforcement. Bully is so overrun with wage complaints that there's no way they can begin to follow up on all of these. And so we've been able to follow up with um, a couple of the legal service providers in the state, Oregon Law Centers, one um, Legal Aid Services Oregon, their farm worker unit up in Woodburn have been able to take on some of these bigger cases. And we have had some success just calling the the um, owner or whoever the foreman is. I mean, there's like Nate was saying, there's like 10, 15 different layers of complexity about our hierarchy of who is, you know, this is the field boss, but this is the guy who's, you know, below the field boss. And then there's, you know, all these different layers. And so we've had some success. Um, if they have like a phone number, if the workers come in with a phone number for, you know, this is, um, I don't know, they always, everybody has a, um, a nickname. So we'll say like El Tigre or something like the tiger, you know, this, this guy's name or El Gordo, the fat guy or whatever. I mean, they all have names like that. So, you know, so we call them and it's like, okay, so, you know, here's the deal. We have, you, we have four of your workers here who haven't been paid. So you can, we have the bully claim ready to go or which we will submit or if you don't pay them. And so a lot of times they don't want any, they don't want any involvement with any of the state agencies. So they'll pay the guys. And, I, and honestly, I think these are the pretty low level um, folks in these operations that, you know, really are there because they hired their friends and now they don't want their friends to, you know, to get stiff for the money, even though they haven't been paid by the people who are one or two or three levels above them. But another, I think, important thing to consider here is um, that these workers, regardless of their immigration status, unless the U.S. citizens, they are risking any type of future immigration benefit. So a lot of families immigrate here because they want to someday become permanent residents or become US citizens. 
they want to raise their children here. They like the healthcare systems. They like the, you know, the education systems. It's just the accessibility to those. And what we're seeing is even people with permanent residency, when you go to apply for um, citizenship, they'll most likely be denied because of their involvement in working with the, even if it's hemp, there's still the, the recommendations are don't even apply for citizenship for at least 10 years after you've quit working in the hemp fields because it will, you'll, most likely you will be denied even US citizenship, even if you are a permanent resident. So these families are really risking a lot here. Um, one thing I think that Sheriff Sickler reached out to us, we have a, a group called the Farm Worker Task Force, which is um, we've can, been convening for about 15 years. So we bring together like a multidisciplinary approach to when the workers come into the valley and how to, how to kind of foresee what kind of issues may come up or what, um, you know, what, current, what the current problems are or needs are. And so last year, it was basically related to COVID. So we wanted to make sure that there was COVID testing available and that there wasn't huge spreads of COVID. And so this year, when we, um, Sheriff Sickler reached out to us about the workers that were being displaced in the raids. And his concern was at, at some times, I mean, these 200 workers were suddenly displaced, where many of them were living there. Um, where were they going? Where were they going for food? Were they, you know, were they needing medical care or things like that? So we developed this resource card, which is wallet size resource card that they can easily fit inside of their wallet. It has a list of organizations that serve the Latino AX community, immigrant communities, essentially up and down I-5 corridor, Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, over on the coast. And so if they find themselves in any of these other areas, these are areas where they can they can call. So we also have the number on there for Boley for DCBS in case of injured workers, um, OSHA again, and Department of Labor if they're um, being contracted, if they have federal contracts, like the, a lot of the H2B workers here, some H2A workers here. And there's also, um, there's some wording on here that says that if you find yourself in a situation and you need help, you know, communicate with whatever, or with any of these organizations, and they can help you figure out, you know, the resources. And then on this other side, it's upside down, but we also have the list of the, um, the three most common consulates for people to contact as well as legal services. And also a little disclaimer, this is something like, um, if you are somehow a victim of crime, you may be eligible for certain immigration benefits. And so we've, we um, also have vaccine clinics every Sunday here in Medford next to Dairy Queen over in uh, La Placita. And we do about a hundred vaccines a weekend there. And so we've been handing out these cards. We don't ask them openly if you working in the hemp. Sometimes we'll ask them, oh, you know, do you work in the fields? Oh yeah, yeah, we work in the fields. And so they, we've been handing out these cards and they very carefully tuck these in their pockets. So ideally where we send out, like I mentioned, we've given out like 2,500. We just had another 2,500 printed and we took um, several all, as well over to Josephine County because the Sheriff's Department over there requested them as well. So I just want to thank Nate for um, reaching out to us on that because the, like I mentioned, I don't know how, I don't know how to express it more that these are very vulnerable workers. They're afraid. They're afraid that their families are going to be harmed in Mexico. They're afraid that if they um, lose this job, what, how are they going to support their families? So um yeah, so if you have questions or anything, or if you have families that you would like to um, refer to UNETE, our number's on here, 245-1625, our phone, and we'd be happy to um, help you to help those families um, figure out different resources. So all those issues that we've just talked about and many more, this has been in the works for several years, really since 2017. Uh, House Bill 3000 was passed this last um, legislative session. And that closed the loophole between, like I said, uh, the cultivation of hemp and marijuana. It made it a crime uh, now to grow hemp without a license. So it's a low level misdemeanor, but it does give our detectives, um, police officers, sheriff's deputies, state police, the ability to write a search warrant to go inspect the um, grows if there's no licensing in place. And to give you an idea how um, how much fraud there is within the hemp uh, industry right now. So uh, House Bill 3000 also created the ability for the OLCC to take over uh, some of the inspection authority to assist ODA because ODA, like I said, only had one inspector in Jackson and Josephine County. So OLCC was given statutory authority to do that temporarily. I think it's for two years um, until the permanent rules can be uh, made. Um, 
And uh, so they came down and they did a operation, they called it Operation Table Rock, in which they identified about 315 or so, and my numbers, you know, I'm saying these from memory, but it was close to that, uh, 315 or so sites between Jackson and Josephine County that they wanted to inspect that had ODA licensing. And um, they actually inspected about 200 and I, I can't remember the exact number, just over 200. And they found 54% of those were growing marijuana. So they inspected 60% and half of those were growing marijuana. Uh, about another 30 either denied access or refused to allow contact with the OLCC. So can infer what's going on there. They also dealt with some bait and switch. So there were some, some processes. Uh, there were, there's obviously hesitation. There's been some you know, legislative pushes to you know, not necessarily defund, but certainly impose more regulations at the state legislature. Some people want to defund, not all. Um, but those things that they, those uh, parameters. So getting this through house and through our legislative session is a big hurdle in my opinion, but there were some more we wanted in, but it was like, don't push uh, what you got going here. Um, but because of the, the things and the way it was set up, the OLCC would go out, they would do a uh, initial test and if that came back as presumptive, they would have to go back and do a follow-up test. So there could be a actual, the due process piece and whatnot. And they found the plants were switched out of the ground. So the plants they inspected the first time were gone. And now there are these little starters that were hemp, not marijuana. So they had a, a little bit of that. And so I would say, and they didn't get to a hundred or so sites. So there's a significant, um, you know, just estimating, we'd probably say 65 to 75 percent fraud within the ODA system as far as who's growing hemp versus marijuana. Um, and, and again, they should only be growing hemp in the ODA program. So significant issues. Um, so what are we going to do moving forward, knowing all these things? So the big thing is we need more resources um, for regulation and for law enforcement. You know, this is a big thing. We, we put all these things in place and we don't have the infrastructure to support it, right? And, and that has led us down a path of where we are today, which is essentially out of control um, gr growing of, of marijuana and by some pretty nefarious organizations. We do have confirmed cartel in our ballot and uh, they are very active within the marijuana and cannabis industry. Um, we, we need enough funding and um, for law enforcement that we can go out and deal with the illegal actors, the ones that are growing marijuana illegally. And we need additional funding for our code enforcement and the water master, and those were kind of touched on. Um, and we're doing that. We're working with our state legislators, uh, state senators, the county, everybody's working together, which is um, not unusual. We always work together uh, very well. But I think, you know, I was talking to our state senator today and I saying, hey, look, there's bipartisan support and at all levels to get additional funding here locally right now, whether or not the the uh, the legislative body will determine that they're going to send us funding funding. It is kind of rare when everybody across the board is saying, yeah, there's a real problem. And the answer is we need more funding for enforcement and regulation, uh, stronger penalties for those engaging in large scale illegal marijuana cultivation. So right now, if you grow one greenhouse on your property that's illegal or a hundred, it doesn't really matter, it's the same penalty. Uh, the drug laws in Oregon are very soft anyway. Um, one ten has contributed to that. So it's really not a lot of deterrent for individuals to, to try to take risk and to plant these big operations because if they get away with it, they're gonna be pretty wealthy uh, or at least the opportunities there. And if they get caught, there's very little consequence. So, you know, it's risk versus reward. We need a moratorium on OLCC and hemp licenses. So that's one thing I think Oregon really messed up when we started this is there was no uh, limit on the how many people could apply. Now the limit was, could they get in, you know, could they get approved in a timely manner? But again, there wasn't the infrastructure set up. So this is a step that we'll be advocating for, um, at least from my position, and I think that um, the, the county's position, but I'll let Danny talk more about that if he wants to. Um, destruction capability for hoop houses. So this is a big problem for our for our uh, boots on the ground, our IMET team is some of these grows are huge, hundreds, uh, hundreds, 110, 120, 130 hoop houses. And you've seen the size of those um, and they have to go through there and they can use small equipment to maybe pull out the plants, but we can't destroy the hoop houses, right? When it would be really nice to run those over with a tractor because they're 
merely constructed to further criminal enterprise. So that's a legislative change that we're asking for is, hey, we need the, the liability protection to, to write a search warrant, you know, deter, have a judge determine that we have probable cause and then be protected statutorily to run these over in good faith. Um, deny licenses and applications after prior violations. Uh, right now, people who are in the ODA program, uh, they have failed to turn in their test results as required because they're supposed to self-report and turn in tests of their hemp grows and the percentage of THC within those grows. They don't, they get a license the year after, they've been contacted by law enforcement, found to be growing marijuana, and in some cases they begin licensing afterwards. So that needs to change. Um, let's see, stronger penalties for repeat offenders. We do that for DUIs, we do it for other offenses. And yeah, you know, technically I guess, you know, and I'm not the best one to explain this, but if you continue to get criminal convictions, you know, you're, you, you can move through the sentencing guidelines, but really it needs to be set up something like a, like the DUI. If you get caught growing multiple times and you've run afoul of the rules that there should be stronger penalties for repeat offenders. It just makes sense. Um, also, we need local control. We need the ability to expand time, place, and manner to hemp because there's no rules in that because it's considered a, you know, agricultural crop. And so there's really very little you can do with that. And again, if you have questions, then maybe Ted or Danny can explain that a little better. But essentially, we were able to do that with marijuana, but not hemp. And of course, then these hemp grows are huge, but they're really marijuana grows. So it's just a very, there's a lot of ways to circumvent the system and to, um, you know, find the loopholes. Uh, the county passed in 2014, when Measure 91 was coming down the uh, pike, the county actually, by voters, passed a tax to tax marijuana locally so we could pay for the impacts to the resources to manage it and all the issues. Well, when Measure 191 passed, um, they said, no, you're not going to be able to tax at the local level. Um, and this is a real brief summary of all that. But essentially, the state would do it and divvy up the funds. And you can see right now we're not getting enough to even begin to cover the issues that it's caused for our community. You know, we love to have the have water rights and a plan or prerequisite for approved OLCC and ODA permits. So meaning there has to be a water plan so they uh, so diversion is less likely or it's more easier to detect. Uh, there's just a lot of things. And of course, increased penalties, civil and criminal for issues related to water. So very light penalties for theft of water, misuse of water, things of that nature. So that was something else we'd like to see expanded. Bottom line <laughs> is we're working with um, Peter Courtney right now through Jeff Golden, also Pam Marsh is pretty engaged. There's a committee for that House Bill 3000 that's looking over a request we made to add 37 additional staff. That's how many st more staff we think we need to be able to get a handle on this. That's across law enforcement, code enforcement, and water. And uh, they're considering making an e-board allocation right now not for the full amount requested, but enough to get us through uh, up to April to begin staffing that number of 37 additional FTE um, and then giving an allocation that will be a more statewide approach in a February special session. So that's the only thing that I didn't hear you mention in too much detail, Nate. And then lastly, you know, um, I know I'm going to be sitting on some some committees or some work groups up in Salem. One is going to be the labor trafficking piece for sure. And, you know, obviously that's, that's a huge part of this, the victimization of, of, of those who are working in these groves. Um, but the bottom line is, is, you know, I'm certainly an advocate of the, the issue is the illegal marijuana industry, the legal marijuana industry, th these people follow the rules. They do what they're supposed to do. They report all the things that are, required by the state. They follow the employment tax rules. I mean, everything is on the above board. It's the illegal industry. And if we get rid of that, we, we root out a bunch of other problems as well. So really, you know, we can put a lot of uh, emphasis on the symptoms, so to speak, and probably never get the problem completely rooted out. What we need to do is just get rid of the problem. And that's the, the illegal or the black market industry. So, okay, any questions for anyone? I'll turn it back over to Eric. I'm dying to jump in. Uh, this is Travis. So both on a personal and professional level, I think that this, this topic has been just sincerely an ass kicker in this valley. So I'm, I'm a third generation. My kid are fourth gen, kids are fourth generation here. I don't recognize the valley that we live in anymore. And I think that 
it's a much bigger question, I think, for this group and really this entire county and this entire community is what do we want it to look like moving forward? And I think that we're making decisions in this, well, statewide and certainly locally that has allowed this industry to really overrun a tremendous amount. And let me tell you something, this water thing it is a gigantic deal. And I wish the water master is here because I'm sure he's tired of taking my calls. It, what the, the thievery of the water and the abuse and waste of the water is something we will never get back. I'm telling you, it's far more than just a drought. When, when this entire valley was built on Butte Creek, and I'm telling you, when we run out of water, it's gone. We're not getting it back. And, and then what do we do? And what does this place look like? And then on, on, a, on a personal level, I own, I live rurally in, in Jackson County out, outside of Ashland, and I have irrigation rights. Um, they, there's many times that I'll have zero water show up, zero. And on my little feed are three families that have had hundreds of years of water rights there and never once in those hundred years not had water because it's stolen. And I, I literally took half of a year of my life to chase down a certain individual who was stealing the water. It turns out he's a multimillionaire from Alabama who just pays some degenerate locally to grow his pot. He doesn't care anything about this community. He doesn't care anything about the damage that he does, the water he steals. There's no boundaries to the things they will do because they just simply don't care. And then on a personal or a professional level, I get a call, I would say 12 a week from people that want to build buildings illegally. They want to pay in cash. A lot, a lot, a lot of out of town people want to come here. Um, we choose not to do it. However, people are obviously doing it. It's, it's just a, I'm telling you guys, we're in a, we're, it's a tough, a tough battle. And I think that these same Oh, I don't know. I could talk for hours, Nate. I, it, it's just a really, really tough battle. And I don't know how to do it. But philosophically, we have to decide what we want this valley to look like. It's changing rapidly. And this is having a real negative impact on, on the future that certainly we will see and our children will see in this valley. Travis, thank you for those, those comments. Are there other comments or questions for any of our speakers around this subject today? Eric, this is Danny. I, I do want to add, I'm just assuming people saw this and I didn't hear Nate talk too specifically of it, but he did mention we've been asking for years for help from the state. And I, I wanna point out the argument here that the state preempted our right to impose a local tax. It would have gave us the ability to deal with this on our own with the promise of funding us to do it. Um, at the high point we received, the county received about $800,000 a quarter. After ballot measure 110 redirected funds to treatment, we're receiving about $200,000 a quarter. Uh, clearly, that doesn't meet the need for managing the impacts from uh, marijuana or illegal cannabis. I do want to tell you there are other uh, impacts that we didn't really talk about today. So as people do these illegal grades, they destroy survey markers. It costs us thousands of dollars every time to go out and reset a survey marker so that people can have uh, property lines that are dependable. Um, it really is impacting our roads. We have, you know, several hundred miles of gravel roads. And when you put these weighted water trucks on them, especially when there's uh, a drought, it creates uh, uh, divots and ruts and all sorts of things in the road. It creates dust and there's problems with dust abatement materials not working because they've been trashed by heavy trucks. And we can't even fix the roads because we don't have enough water to go out and, and be able to add enough moisture to grade them. There's huge cost impacts all across the county. We're asking the state legislature and the governor to step up and help fund these things I talked about. We did that informally and also through our legislators for multiple legislative sessions. After this last session and the legislature passed House Bill 3000 and not to be rude, it did some good as the sheriff mentioned, but there was a lot of patting on the backs by legislators that they fixed the issue. So our board through our staff made a detailed inventory of all the things that we thought House Bill 3000 missed. And our board agreed to pass an emergency declaration asking the state for help, whether it be by way of funds or direct services where they divert, you know, water resource staff or Oregon State Police. 
I'm sure everyone saw the bust over uh, Friday that 500 to 600,000 pounds of marijuana that Oregon State Police led working with local law enforcement as well. But we need help. And the fact is that the state made promises legalizing this that they're not keeping. And it's mostly in the grand way affecting Jackson County. We are ground zero, no doubt. Now we're starting to hear other counties are beginning to have impacts. And I kind of have to laugh. I'm going to show uh, quote the uh, Sheriff Sickler here in a call with legislators, Yamhill and Polk County was concerned because they had uh, seven grows this year and they needed help. And Sheriff Sickler said, I could take you to seven grows on Vilas Road. Um, so I don't think people get the magnitude of how bad it is here when you're not from here. And also I believe people here have become sensitized to it. Seven Grows is a big deal in Yamhill and Polk County. It's huge for them. They've had none. Uh, seven Grows, if you said we had seven Grows here, people would laugh. So I, I want everyone on this call to know that our board of commissioners has taken this extraordinarily seriously. Our governor has not publicly responded to our request. So there is some legislators who have, as I said, we're working directly with Peter Courtney's office, who's the Senate president, who has uh, developed some support for a funding package. I'm actually working with the governor's office and some of the governor's staff, but I am uh, pretty um, disappointed by the fact that there's been no public statement directly from our governor regarding this issue. It, 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 uh, it needs state intervention. There's no way we can do it locally by ourselves. Uh, and it, it, it likely needs you know, heavy state intervention, not just with funds, but with staff support. So uh, Nate, I know I didn't hear you talk about the emergency declaration our board made, but we've gone as far as we can possibly go to beg for help, ask for help, demand help, make the problem be known and be aware. And I just want everyone on the on, at the meeting to know that. Thank you, Danny. Are there any other questions or comments today? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the part about the the human, you know, labor trafficking and human trafficking is something that to me obviously is a huge concern. And uh, and thank you, Kathy, for the information that you brought. And I can totally see how you know the vulnerability of people that are marginalized already for many many reasons, including immigration. You know situations and language barriers and, and safety. And like, when I hear that there are people, armed guards at this gross, at this illegal gross, it just, you know, really terrifies me what people could be enduring in these places. And, and I was just curious, I would love to learn more about that and know who, who are the code enforcers for that. And I imagine it's law enforcement, right? But um, yeah, and I know that I understand, uh, Sheriff Sickler, what you said about just like the differentiation between illegal and illegal in the industry, but I feel like we need to uh, also put some attention on, on what people may be experiencing. And so I'm really grateful for this presentation to everyone that has contributed. Thank you. Yeah, and let me just add in response to that, that as part of our emergency declaration, the county did ask the governor for more staff support for Bully, and that's the Department of Consumer and Business Services. Andrew Stolfi, who's the director of Bully, has been in phone conversations with myself and governor staff, as well as OLCC and uh, ODA. And I know the sheriff has been in contact with legislators and staff regarding getting more assistance for bully. That is the place where that issue is investigated. So our code enforcement or law enforcement run into those uh, worker rights violations issues. We, we do contact bully. The problem here for the state and bully is that they're complaint driven. They do no proactive approach and they're, 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 they're under, under resourced, just like every other, uh, uh, part of the system here that we're talking about has the major impact. So we have asked the governor as well for assistance for bully, which is, you know, basically state regulated to help deal with those worker rights uh, and worker uh, living condition issues. And uh, HSI, which is Homeland Security, <clears throat> does do investigations on labor in the human trafficking aspect with our IMET team too. So they're out there trying to put those pieces together. Barbara, did you have a question or comment? I do have a comment because I believe that um, all of you all are doing a tremendous job in trying to abate the issue that is clearly growing faster and at lightning speed than any of us are able to understand. Um, with that said, I'm back to Travis's point. Um, our quality of life here has become horrific. You can describe it as the because of the fires and the drought, but that is not it. All, I have asthma. I am sick for months now because of these um, grows going on. I think as a community, we are all our community members. 
we have a resp res responsibility to contact the governor, to contact our representatives and tell them that we are not going to put up with this. And it needs to be a campaign that's united that we all are working towards because this impacts us for generations to come. And if I could just add on that, uh, thank you, Barbara, but it is important to contact your state representatives and, and the legislators because it may seem like one call doesn't make a difference or one letter, but it does. I mean, oh, yeah. it's a little bit at a time and the more they hear, the more it, it, it helps put things in perspective um, for the entire community, not just a few people who are upset about it. So I, I think you should contact Jeff Golden and Pam Marsh, and they're really they're really trying to. They're not they're they're in our corner. So with that being said, it just gives them more uh, ammunition, so to speak, when they when they talk to their coworkers or their partners up in Salem. And let me just add that the Marijuana Advisory Committee is advisory to our Board of Commissioners, and I'm not saying it's not good to provide them input. They have adequate input to request the resources we've requested from the state. This really requires action on behalf of the state. They took away our ability to help ourselves. They undermanaged the issue. Um, they made the rules that we have to operate by and they have a responsibility to step up and help. So I just want everyone to know that there are a lot of local groups working on this that have a lot of ideas about how it should be resolved. But the bottom line is it comes down to resource and it comes down to really taking this out at, as Sheriff Sickler pointed out right at the core of the problem, which is the illegal marijuana and hemp grows. Yes, there are labor issues, there are violation issues and all sorts of things that legal grows, but we can work those and those people tend to work with us to come into compliance. And then it's not the issue. Um, but <clears throat> I don't want to detract anyone from volunteering to work on our advisory committees. I just want you to know that a lot of people come to the board of commissioners and want them to fix a problem that the state has created uh, you know, by state law, by state rules, through state agencies that don't give control or resources directly to the county. For example, I think it's great that cities get a cut of, you know, marijuana tax, and it's great that they can build a park with it or do something really nice to help improve their city. But we're over here struggling to even stop illegal marijuana grows. It makes zero sense to me that we don't deal with the problem before everyone derives the benefit. And some cities receive the benefit and do put it into enforcement, but enforcement in a city around dispensaries is way different than enforcement out in the county around production, especially in Southern Oregon. And I think the state just has failed to recognize a whole lot of those issues. So I'm pounding on the state here, but this is one place where I think it's called for. And I think the governor needs to act and our legislature needs to act in way more thoroughly than they did with House Bill 3000. Thank you, Danny. I wanna thank Sheriff Sickler, Ted and Danny for speaking on behalf of the county on this issue. And Kathy, thank you so much for bringing a voice to this table for people who often don't have the ability to speak on their own for their own needs. It was so needed and important. And I hope you can continue to uh, inform us as uh, concerns and progress uh, happens for, for the population of labor who are doing so much of this work and being harmed. So thank you. Um, this does conclude our meeting for the day. I appreciate everybody's time and participation, um, and it, we will look for future times to discuss progress and um, the impact that this is having on our daily lives. So thank you all for uh, your attendance today.